Well, we are at 7.30, so let's get started, folks. Um, welcome to our talk tonight, Container Gardening with Native Plants, which is going to be given by Pete Villa. But before we start uh, the talk, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, CNPS and um, some other things around that. Um, let me... uh, but before I do that, I wanted to acknowledge that the work done by the Santa Clara Valley chapter of CNPS lies in the homeland of the Muwekma Ohlone, the Amamutsan Tribal Band, the Tamian Nation, and the Ramaytush Ohlone. This is land that was theirs for thousands of years before it was forcibly taken from them. Despite two centuries of oppression and genocide, they still live and thrive in this area today. We acknowledge and respect them for their land stewardship, their culture, language, and humanity. The Santa Clara Valley chapter of CNPS hopes to learn from them and support their work to restore traditional practices and heal from historical trauma. And I wanted to welcome everybody to our talk tonight, but if this is your first talk with us, we would love to know how you found out about us and where you are. So if you don't mind sharing that in chat, um, we'd really appreciate it and welcome. And our talks are not just the speaker and me, the host. Uh, it takes a team to do this. So tonight um, I'm acting as a host and I'm also doing technology support. But we also have our QA moderator, Gladys, Mer Gladys Mercier, and our YouTube moderator, Barbara Hunt. So for those of you on Zoom, um, if you didn't know it, we are also simultaneously broadcasting on YouTube. And uh, you are welcome to type in questions into chat. Uh, and uh, Barbara will be, make sure that any chat questions get copied over to us here over in Zoom. Uh, this talk and, uh, is sponsored by the California Native Plant Society which is a nonprofit environmental organization that was founded in 1965. We have over 10,000 members and 35 chapters, and they're spread all over California and even beyond the borders of the country and the state, uh, because we also have a chapter in Baja, California. Our chapter is the Santa Clara Valley chapter, and we cover all of Santa Clara County, as well as Southern San Mateo County. And CNPS's mission is to save California's native plants and their habitats. And we do it through science, education, conservation, and gardening. If you're not currently a member of CNPS, we would love to have you join us. It'll support our movement um, to conserve California's native plant diversity. And you get some great membership benefits. And that includes two journals, Artemisia, which is a science-oriented uh, journal, and then Flora, which has a lot of great general information topics, um, especially around horticulture. So if you're, if you're here, you're probably into gardening. Flora is an amazing magazine uh, that has a lot of information about native plant gardening. You'll also receive the Blazing Star, which is our chapter newsletter. That'll give you information about our activities and also just information article, informational articles as well. Um, and you also get access to members only events and activities and discounts at various local nurseries. So if you're not currently a member, please consider joining and you can do that online. Go to cnps.org slash join and you can sign up right there. Uh, our chapter also has its own nursery and that is the source of most of our chapter's funds. So anything you buy from us uh, will help to fund everything that we do. Um, we're currently on a restricted summer sale. So we, you can order online um, for $250 orders and above, and we can deliver to you, and that's between Belmont and San Jose. Um, we also have more than just plants. We have t-shirts and books, um, native plant live here signs. So you can just go to us, see us online and shop to your heart's content at night and, and then have your plants delivered. And that's at cnps-scv.org cnps-scv-nursery. You can simply go to our website, which is cnps-scv.org, and there's a link to the nursery right there. We have quite a few events coming up in August, um, starting with this one, but we also have a field trip um, to the East Bay on Saturday. There are only a few slots left, and it is only for CNPS members, so this is another reason. If you're not currently a member, you might want to join. 
And it is a tour of the Regional Parks Botanic Garden with the uh, garden director, Bart O'Brien, who also happens to be a past president of our chapter. That's in Tilden Park. And if you're interested in um, going, it's completely free. But as I mentioned, there's only a few slots left. Uh, that is at um, nine o'clock on Saturday. So go to our website, cnps-scv.org. Look for the field trip under the menu item. And there's a link there to sign up to attend. Uh, next week, we have a talk on gardening for butterflies and caterpillars by Susan Karatsoff. And she is uh, with the Yerba Buena chapter, which is the San Francisco chapter of CNPS. Um, the week after that, we have a, another talk on uh, rare, the paintbrushes in peril, rare, rare Castellier species in North America. That was going to be really fascinating. And then we'll finish out our talks for the month with a climate change talk, um, what works and what you can do. And the great thing about this one is if you are worried about climate change and feeling helpless, um, this talk will give you a few solid action items that you can do in just a few minutes each day. So uh, it's a great place to get started as a climate change activist. And then finishing out the month, if you like photography uh, and or if you just like looking at pretty pictures, um, you can join our photography, group, photography groups show and tell. That's uh, the last Friday of the month. And if you are a photographer who has pictures you would like to share, um, you can also do that as well. It's open to everybody. So that's a fun thing to do on a Friday evening. Um, and if you want to find out about these on a regular basis or just see what's going on, you can always find them on our meetup group. Um, also on our website, cnps-scv.org, or get a weekly message on our, from our chapter news mailing list. And uh, that list is one that you can subscribe to. It's a Google group. You can uh, write this long address down that's up on the slide right now, or you can simply go to our website and there's information there on how to join if you're not currently receiving that news email. It's just one message a week and it tells you what's coming up next. And if you enjoy Zoom and like helping out with it, we could certainly use more help. So both our QA moderator and YouTube moderator positions, all you have to be able to do is use a keyboard, a mouse, switch windows, copy and paste, and we will explain everything else to you. So if that sounds like something you'd like to help with, uh, please send Madeline a message. Her email address is right there, Madeline Morrow at earthlink.net. Uh, that's also information that you can find on our website under the help wanted page. So please uh, think about helping out if that sounds like something you could do, you want to do. And a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, if your microphone is not currently muted, except for you, Pete, because you will be speaking soon, uh, please mute your microphone. If you have any questions or comments, please type them into the chat box at any point. We will be asking Pete anything that you bring up at the end of his talk. We do expect to finish by nine o'clock. And as I mentioned before, the program is being simulcast on YouTube um, where you can watch it immediately. And if you enjoy the talk, you can share it with your friends. Um, so tonight's program is Container Gardening with Native Plants by Pete Vio. He's a master gardener, a nurseryman, and a photographer. He creates gardens using native plants for long lasting landscapes that help people get the maximum use and pleasure from their patch of earth. He is the owner and propagator at East Bay Wilds Native Plant Nursery, which is eastbaywilds.com, and that's in Oakland. He's a tireless advocate of nav native gardening, and I have to plug his nursery. He did not pay me to do this. I absolutely love his nursery. If you have not been there, I highly recommend going, uh, both if you want to see amazing container plant. Uh, I mean, it's just inspirational to go there, but also, Pete has one of the broadest collections of native plants I found in the Bay Area. So if you're looking for something obscure or just, just wanna see a whole variety of plants, East Bay Wild is the place to go. So Pete, I am gonna turn it over to you now, but really everyone, Pete is amazing. He is just a, a great guy and we are, I'm absolutely thrilled to have him here tonight. Thank you, thank you very much. I hit share screen now, right? Yes. Okay. And it'll say that you, you're gonna stop my share and it should start it for you. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. 
Great. Thank you. That was a great introduction. Um, I really like what you said about the First Nations people in the beginning, too. That's something that's so often um, missed in our events. So um, welcome, everybody. And please don't hesitate to ask questions. And you can interrupt me to ask questions, too. It's not going to mess it up or anything like that. So it's not that formal. Um, but could somebody tell me when we're halfway through and then three quarters of the way through? Sure, we'll do that. Just, just so that I, I know where I am. Okay, so I'm gonna jump in and welcome everybody. And I'm just gonna flip through pictures and these are just native plants that we've tried over the years um, in containers and some successfully, some not so successfully. Um, they, like there's, some things do like really wonderful all the time containers and are very easy, whereas other things are very easy if you just know a few little tricks of the trade, and I can tell you about those. So this is a Dudleya Noma, a Munchkin Dudleya. This is like hugely sought after worldwide at the moment, unfortunately, but um, they're only found in two little places on Cedros Island off Baja. So here's the, this is what you see when you come into our nursery. Um, and there's a few different containers here that I've had been growing this this manzanita in this container for like seven or eight years now, something like that, or maybe more than that, but a long time. So, um, but mainly we're landscapers. And I just wanted to show you a couple of pictures of our landscapes. And this is where, what we do for four days out of the week. And then the nurseries open on one day out of the week. On, it, we're open every Friday from 9.30 to four. But these are a couple of our landscapes that we've done over the years. Um, and we use a huge variety of plants in our, in our landscapes. Um, and we try to get in a thriving community going. Um, I use a lot of manzanitas. Um, I love manzanitas. I love buckwheats and manzanitas, two very iconic groups of plants um, for California, for sure. So in fact, um, in California, uh, or Worldwide, there's like 160 or 150 different kinds of um, manzanitas and all but like six or seven of those are found only in California. So we're in the cradle of evolution of manzanitas here. Um, whereas buckwheats are found all over the Western, West Coast, or all over the Western United States. Um, I just wanted to put this up to show that this is where all of my inspiration comes from, for sure, is from the wild. And I try to get away every other weekend. I try to go explore somewhere in California. Um, it, and I've been all around the state. And I really en enjoy uh, exploring the wild places and just being inspired by the native plants in them. Um, and here you can see the way that the plants work with the rocks so well. And that's gives you a pretty good idea of what kind that that these plants might work pretty well in containers and they do conifers and manzanitas some of them do very very well in containers especially ones that are found in extremely rocky environments like this so and then this is back in new hampshire vermont uh, where my family is um, and i started the whole thing when uh, we built our house when i was 10 out in the woods and I landscaped it when I was 10 with things that I found in our woods. And here's a few of them right here. Um, I just took this a couple months ago when I was back visiting, back there visiting. Uh, and I'm very proud of the garden. Anyway, the main garden there, it's, uh, I've been working on it for 40 something years now um, and it's looking pretty nice. So. Anyway, here's the nursery. Um, we collect all kinds of, I've been collecting tchotchkes and things for years too. I go to flea markets and stuff like that. So I've got loads and loads of garden tchotchkes and things to, to look at and to, and to buy if you want to. So um, this, this is actually a container garden here. This is a very large container. I just wanted to show you that containers can be very small or they can be quite large. This is a, a built up container that's four feet high um, against a house here. Um, and then they can be very small. This is a very small one here. Um, and here's one I did recently with a big hollowed out rock. It weighs a ton. This thing, it does, cannot be moved 
really. And I planted in it, I planted a winter glow manzanita, um, which does, it, as long as the pot is big enough, it does well. But I have a feeling I'm gonna have to move it out of this in a couple of years. So it, the, the winter glow is not one of those. There's, there's some that really work well in containers. Um, and I'll talk about more about those later on. And here we have some um, Dudleya, the Munchkin Dudleya, the Dudleya Noma. And this is Aspidotus densa or the serpentine lace fern. That The serpentine lace fern and the California lace fern both are very easy in containers, I find. And I'll talk more about those later. Um, here's a container I, I planted it like six or seven years ago and totally forgot about until I um, went to visit the other day. And here it was. This is a the, the yellow inside out flower or the golden inside out flower, Vancouveria chrysantha. It's a rare plant um, and it's beautiful in containers and can thrive. This has been six or seven years without being touched except for getting water um, on this shady porch and it just looks gorgeous. So the leaves are pretty, it does go a little bit dormant in winter but not completely dormant. So this. So more at the nursery here. Um, I'm probably more into foliage color than I am into flowers for, for containers. But um, I also like flowers. We'll, we'll see a lot of those too. Vine maples, that's one of the larger things that you can grow in containers pretty well. It does take bonsai very well too. It's actually a close relative of the Japanese maple as well. Um, Here's a container. Here's some containers I saw the other day at, at the Oakland Museum that we did a couple of years ago. Um, for the, but it's a very, very shady garden. I didn't think that we would be successful with it, but these plants could survive in a very, very shady environment. So they're doing okay. They're great, so so. Anyway, um, and we do. We try. We're always trying all kinds of weird things to in container. This is our, our wonderful giant horsetail, the um, Equisetum telmadie brownie eye or whatever it's called. Um, but in the wild, th this past weekend, I was camping up on the, on the um, Sonoma co coast and um, th the giant horsetails were about twice as tall as me there. They were enormous. And the scouring, the giant scouring rushes were too. They were like 10 feet tall. Um, so were the giant cow parsnips. <laughs> it was pretty amazing. Um, but anyway, was, and then I came across this photo of one that I had uh, grew in a pot a long time ago. So here's one that uh, in the Oakland Museum with a vine maple here and some ginger and some deer ferns and stuff. We had some issue problems with the pH with this because the this is in a big fish pond here. Um, so we did have problems there. Anyway, a very easy one for the shade um, is the Southern Maidenhair Fern. Um, it's used worldwide in containers um, and they can get quite large too. Here's just a small one. I just love the colors of it. I love the way it moves in the breeze. Here's a really big one. Um, they just grow and grow. Just keep them a little bit moist. Um, these also go semi-dormant in the winter, but really they're pretty nice looking here. Here it is growing with Dudleya and some fringe cups. Um, and natives can be bonsai. Here's a buckeye that's been bonsai beautifully. And I took this picture at a, what was it? It was a, I think it was a CNPS event or something. Anyway, it's a beautiful buckeye bonsai there. I love bonsai, I love buckeyes too, so. Um, and here's more ferns. And, and this is, uh, this is one that I wish I took a picture of it today, but um, this is the bird's foot fern, which does very, very well in, in a container, as long as you have plenty of rocks in with it. Growing here with a Dudley of Farinosa. Um, this is probably my, believe it or not, my most successful plant in a container. Be and the reason is that this is a, a type of um, service berry, an amelanchier, and it's got alma folia, but it's also utensils. It doesn't fall clearly in one or the other. It's from a cutting I took um, out on Mines Road um, near Livermore many years ago. And this has been in this container for 17 years now. 
17, maybe 18 years now in the same container. And it's not that large of a container, but this thing produces so much fruit. It's, a tr it's amazing. I, I, every other day when it's fruiting, for about a month, every other day, I pick two handfuls of fruit off this plant growing in a small container. This is just bizarre to me. So we do dig it out once a year so that I can take cuttings off it because um, I haven't gotten it to come up by seed. Um, so I just get the root cuttings and grow it from that. But this is our wonderful service berry. And there it is in flower. Um, the leaf is very pretty, it turns pretty colors in the fall too. So and then it varies. Um, but we also do annuals in containers. I'm always, I, I sell seed also, actually I will be soon, not yet, but I have a lot of seed to sell, but um, this is um, the red ribbons pakia. Um, but I, I'm always putting, planting it in pots with other things too. There's a big farewell to spring in container, more container with blue eye, uh, with uh, baby blue eyes and Chinese houses, poppies and some uh, meadow foam, I guess. So more. anyway, they're all in containers. This is a large container with a giant elk clover growing with a hoikara and some ginger and a few other things. Mixed containers sometimes work. Oftentimes, they, uh, you know, one thing tends to win out over the others over time, um, unless you're continuing to dig it up and um, split it and repot them. So which as it, you know, that's how we grow things at the nursery. So I do that a lot, um, but that sometimes can work well. Um, I've grown madrones until they've been about 10, 12 feet tall in containers before. Um, they're wonderful to, to grow in containers is if you can keep them alive, they can be a little bit tricky because they cannot completely dry out in containers, um, but they don't like a lot of water either. Um, and I recommend growing, when, if you're gonna plant one in your yard, which I highly recommend, um, start with a small one, not a big one. They do much better in my experience. And we've, we've planted a lot of them and grown a lot of these in, in, the, yard, in the ground and in, in containers. So, and like I said, some manzanitas can, you can grow to quite a large size. There's one um, that I planted about um, 16 years ago that's near me. It's in a really large pot. It's about four feet, about three and a half feet tall pot, about two and a half feet across. And I planted a Dr. Herd in there and it's still going strong many years later and it gets zero care. So here's a, this is a, um, what is it? This is the, um, it's the cross between um, Edmundsii and Uva Ursi. It's a the tiny, very, very slow growing Manzanita. I get that in the room. Oh well. Um, it's not the best one anyway. Um, thought I'd turn this off. Excuse me. Um, this one does not do very well over time in container anyway. For a couple of years, it's all right. But after that, it needs to go in the ground where it's incredibly slow growing. So, but it does have pretty little leaf tips and stuff. But that he gets that from Edmundsii. So here's the large um, container that we did. Um, yeah, and this is the winter glow manzanita here. Shasta sulfur buckwheat. Some, some. Um, actually, this has changed quite a bit. This was a big olive here, but um, we've replaced that with a big sur manzanita. But we have a large manzanita on this side. We have a Austin Griffiths. Then we've espaliered on this side against this wall here, um, a pajaro manzanita. And it's actually taken the espalier very, very well. So, and then this winter glow manzanita, see that it's just starting to turn orange here, but eventually it turns very, very orange um, and just completely covered. Here's another um, Edmundsii growing in a pot. And then I really like white-leaved and gray-leaved manzanitas. And this is the obispoensis, the San Luis Obispo or serpentine manzanita, um, Austin Griffiths. Now this is one that does do well over the long term in containers. I, I've, I've grown these, I've had these in containers for um, 10 years and up. Um, and this is the Big Sur manzanita. It's one of the Edmundsiais, um, but it, it's a little bit more upright than most of the Edmundsiais. This one, and it prunes really well. 
and it gets nice thick trunks even when it's young. So here's another one. This is a Burt Johnson, another Burt Johnson, uh, another Burt Johnson. And then here's a, um, this is the, uh, uh, what is it? It grows, it's from up on Mount Tam actually. This is uh, from a cutting I took many years ago, but this is the, um, gosh, what is wrong with it? The canum. Um, anyway, I'll think of it in a minute and come back to it. So, and then here's a glandulosa manzanita in the back. This gets really lovely purple colors in the bark on this one in very gray leaves. And here's just some short one. I don't know. I don't remember the name of that one. Some deadliest. But here's a big sir. And big sir also has the benefit of um, flowering like crazy, which there might be some photos of one in a container flowering. They get so many flowers, you can barely see the leaves at times. It's the most floriferous of any of the manzanitas that I know of anyway. Um, this is a variegated manzanita. This is the, the Bates yellow, one of Phil Van Salen's um, introductions. I find that it's uh, not so hardy in full sun. So I put it in partial shade where it's doing a lot better. So here's another big stir flowering. So you can see in the container. Um, and I'll talk a bit more in a bit in a little while about what I use for um, container mixes and, and what kind of things I use as containers too. Another big sir, another big sir. This is a Burt Johnson, uh, big sir. And this is my latest find. This is a uh, one that, it, that Tilden um, found. It's a cross that they found at the nursery. It's called silver, they're, they're selling it as silver mist. And it has the most beautiful silver, fuzzy silvery colors to it. It's really wonderful. And we're propagating that one as well. So here's a Burt Johnson. Um, oh, here's the big manzanita, the big Dr. Heard that's been in the container about 16 years now, been in this big container with zero care. And it's still, it's still going strong, it's amazing. So, oh, here's, here's an unusual manzanita for a container. This is a glandulosa, um, and this one is one of the burl formers. And I always wanted it, you know, and I tried several burl formers and I couldn't get them to do well. You don't usually see them in nurseries, the burl forming ones. Manzanitas can be divided into two types, burl formers and non-burl formers. And it's, they're just different strategies. They have different strategies for surviving fires. And the burl is one of them. Um, and then it finally, it done, it, I figured out by having this one for, I had this one in a container for seven or eight years, and then it started to form the burl. And here's the burl. You can see this is about, it's about the size of a bowling ball now in this container. Um, but it takes that many years and they just, they're barely, it barely thrives. It, it doesn't thrive, do very well until it gets that burl. Once it gets that burl, it does really well. Um, so this is, um, about 12 years old in this container. This is a very large container. Um, it comes up to probably my waist, close to my waist, maybe not that high, my thigh. So, but I'm uh, in the nursery, you know, we have a lot of plants and a lot of them I, I'm not quite ready to sell. Um, so I'll put them in containers just to both experiment and to let them grow out and um, see what we can do with them. This is one that I, I know won't be in the container for very long, but it's an experiment. And I do like to use the rocks with them a lot. Here's another manzanita that does very well in container in a container for a long time. And this is the uh, box sleeved uh, manzanita. The, um, it's a hookeri, hookeri buxifolia. And here, here's the uh, an insularis. This is a shag, shag bark manzanita. And one of the wonderful things about manzanitas are the berries. And every species has berries that are different, that turn different colors. Some of them have a real salmon color. This one has very orange berries. Some of them have a nice russet color. Some are dark, some are red. Did somebody have a question? No. Okay. Here's the Solaris. I'm getting an echo right now. Oh, shoot. 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 Oh,
the triggers of colors, you know, some people have a real sad color. What should I do about the echo? Anything? Okay, anyway. Okay, here's another one that does very well in containers for, a, you know, for quite a few years, five or six years at least. And this is Numularia. This is the, the Mendocino Manzanita or, um, yeah, but this one is very, very nice colors in the leaves too. This is it also, this is the Numularia. You find it growing in these, um, up in the sand barrens, up in Mendocino a lot. Oh, this is that um, Glandulosa, just as it was first starting to form the burrow. And here's an Uva Ursi. Uva Ursis are great for about a year or two, but no more than that in containers. Then they want to be in the ground. So here's the goat's beard, the Aruncus dioicus. I'm not quite sure. How to, but this is, this is huge now. This has been in this container for five or six years now, and it's just gigantic with big plumes of white flowers. Pretty. Then the Armaria meridima, of course, is a very easy container, a container plant. This is the sea thrift with the Dudleya. That one. Um, another one. This is the Dudleya noma, which is really one of the most beautiful Dudleyas for a container. Is the Dudleya noma, the Munchkin Dudleya. So um, other things that do well. These these plants tend to they grow in the wild in very crowded, wet situations too. So they're used to the competition, the root competition. This is the redwood sorrel, deer fern, and a wild ginger in a large container. These do pretty well. They behave. Here's another picture of that silver mist manzanita. I'm crazy over. And these are the leaves of the lace fern. This is another, another lace fern. This lace fern I've had in a container for about 12 years now, 14 years, something like that. And every year I divide it. And that's the way I get new ones to, to sell or to, to use in other containers. Here it is again, another of the amelanch here. These are just, this is my old house, my garden outside. Um, I'm a renter, I've been a renter for quite a few years now. And um, so renters love container plants. It's one way we can grow natives and not give, give them up when we move. So it, I, I find that, that um, even when plants are going dormant, um, if they're in decent conditions, they'll get nice colors to them. If they're in the conditions that they thrive under, they tend to get nice colors, even when they're going dormant. Remind us of the seasons. This is a lady fern. Lady ferns are probably the fastest growing plant for a container there is. Um, you can start with like a three or four inch plant and um, within a month have a three foot monster. If you give it water and what it wants, a little bit of food. These are lady ferns. This one is four feet tall, this lady fern, four feet across. And it got this in one season. It got that big. So it's a pretty plant too. These have also done really well. The rhododendron occidentalis, the, the native azaleas, um, have done very well in containers for me. The containers are large enough. Um, this is another one that's very easy in a container and really attractive. And this is the, the berberus. Aquifolium um, compacta. Um, compacta is the one that has the, the matte, not shiny leaves, um, that, and it turns a really nice red maroon color like this. And flowers and berries well in containers. All the berberis do very well in containers. I'm, I've got a few going now um, of the very blue leaved ones, uh, the Dictyota ones. So, and then this is a great one because it's a great butterfly plant and it's so easy in containers. In the ground, it's not so easy unless you have a real wet spot in the gar garden. This is Biden's Lavis or um, the Burr Marigold. It can get quite large in a container. You see here. Um, and what a butterfly magnet it is. Here's that. Oh, this is back when I first planted that 16 years ago or so. Anyway, I do a lot of water containers too with water plants, and those are fun and they're great little bird baths. Another one. This one has an Onanth sarmentosa in it. No matter what you grow in a water pot, it's going to get too big pretty quickly. So just 
be aware of that and and you know when it does get too big just dig it out and, and save just a tiny piece of it put it back in and the rest put in a pond or something um here's the way we do i mean it's very simple to make a bird bath if you have a large pot with no hole in it um but you just gotta remember to pile rocks in it so that whatever goes there has plenty of places where it can lean into the water without falling without drowning so it's very easy to make um, a bird bath water pot here i have it with a little bit of scurpus the little dwarf scurpus that's common around the the tell what is it called the tell us something grass so, and here's with this with a red root sedge growing in the water pot but this is i mean the a lot of plants that grow in the water, I mean, they really suck up the water. So you have to fill them up a lot. Here's growing with the Potentilla anserina, the silverweed, growing with the, the what is it called? The um, micro, what is it? That grass? So, anyway, um, here, Darmera peltata does really well in a large container. Um, here I have growing with that little, that little sedge there and rocks, rocks. More. So, oh, this one is a kind of a funny story. This one we did about 15 years ago. This is a fountain, and this is in a window um, three stories up in the Castro in San Francisco, um, in front of a gallery. And it's um, just it was we were finishing it up just in time for them to have their gallery opening, their big gallery opening, and it was a big deal. Um, and just as we we're finishing, I'd made this one little adjustment by moving this pot a little bit and it ripped the liner and all the water went down onto the street below on, and the streets were very crowded with people. It was a disaster. <laughs> Just thought I'd share that with you. <laughs> There's more. There's that red root flat sedge. Pretty. And then see how they get overgrown very quickly. This is the Potentilla anserina, the silver weed it takes over. Um, the 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 blacknum spicat or it used to be blacknum. This is a deer deer fern, makes a really beautiful um, container plant. I really like it a lot in containers. And I mean, generally they like wetter areas than we can give them in the garden. So containers, it's pretty easy to give them um, that without watering all the time. And that's you just restrict the size of the hole in the bottom of the container. A little bit. Um, you, you plant them in a container with a with a smaller hole. Most things that we plant, manzanitas and stuff like that, I have a big drill that I'm constantly drilling more and more hole, <clears throat> more and more holes in the pots to give things excellent drainage. <clears throat> but the things that don't want good drainage, you just put them in, in a pot with less holes, <clears throat> and you you water them, and then they take a while to dry, dry out that way. And keep them in the shade too, with more shade pots. <laughs> More shade pots. Sorry, those are fireworks that have been going off here forever. So more shade pots. We even grow bulbs in pots. Um, bulbs sometimes are difficult in the ground because the critters get them. Here's a Tritilea laxa, the ethereal spear. And here's a prickly pear from growing the pot. And here's a barrel cactus and some other cactus. Some are native, some aren't here. Um, I grew a lot of grasses in pots. This is a Calamar grassus foliosa, which is a really beautiful plant in a container. Um, I'm not sure if I have a picture, the right picture of it, but this can be really beautiful. In the right container, it's a really nice accent. And then there's other grasses too that I like to use in containers. Um, it got a lot bigger than this, that's for sure. Yeah, like this one here, this is the um, Carex um, spissa, the San Diego sedge. It's a it's the largest sedge in California. And this one, it, it's green. This I took this picture today. Um, it's green right now, but later on, as it dries out a little more, it gets a beautiful blue, glaucous blue color to it. And it's a really nice horizontal plant for a tall container. Um, and easy as anything to grow. Um, I've even tried the pussy pods or the pussy toes, the calyptridiums in containers. And they do okay. And then I also grow, um, they actually, these do a lot better in containers than in the ground, but I do get them in the ground too. But this is the Castileja foliosa, the, the Indian paintbrush. 
um, the woolly, woolly Indian paint brush, something like that. Um, but you just sprinkle some of the seed from these in containers and they come up like crazy in them. Um, and then I grow pentamen sometimes in pots. Um, the hoikaras, hoikara rubescens here. And then here we have uh, the Sierra strawberry, which has a nice blockus green color to it. Here we have a little Cenosis um, Diamond Heights there. And then here's a, a Rigoron Glauca. And then here's another um, Calamagrassus folios, the leafy reed grass. And then here's the, um, this is a Port Orford Cedar. Port Orford Cedars and the Monterey Cypresses have many, many different, have been bred for many, many years for in the ground. And they're, they're, some of them, stay much smaller than the species gets. Um, so they're pretty good for containers. This is a Port Orford cedar, a selection called Elwoodii or Elwood, I think. El, I think that's the name of it. Um, and it's underplanted with sedum spathulifolium corporea. Hey Pete, you wanted yeah. a, a time warning. And yep. we also have quite a few questions built up. So if you, would you mind taking I'll a pause and letting Gladys? No, not at all. I'm going to, I'm going to flip through these while I'm answering the questions. Okay. So, okay, go ahead and shoot. Okay. So we have a lot of questions. I'm going to start at the top and it was about the Dudleyas that you were showing. Do, would a Dudleya go like dormant in the hot interior of the East Bay? Um, in containers, well, in containers. They, some, they, they often do. They, some of them do go dormant and some of them don't. And it's, it, it's kind of, really, I think the trick is to, to make sure that there's really excellent drainage. And as soon as the flowers um, are start to go by a little bit, um, I stop watering them altogether. Um, if they don't, if somebody does water them, if they do get a little water, then they, they tend to look bad. Otherwise, they don't look that bad, even if they're dormant. Um, but generally, after the flower, they do go dormant a little okay. bit. Dormant. But they still look good. Okay. Uh, there's a question here from Susan about would a mallow Lewis Hamilton do well in a container and how large of a container should it be? Any special tips about that plant? I, I don't think it would. I don't think it would because remember that the plants, um, especially desert plants, the way they, they become so incredibly drought tolerant is by getting their roots in very, very deep um, in very, very, you know, so their roots can go like 15 feet deep. Um, pretty quickly. And that's the way that they become drought tolerant is by getting their roots under and all over like that. So sages, and I would suspect the mallows, and the, I mean, even the, the, the mallows that I grow for sale in the nursery, they don't look good after a while. Um, even if they're perfectly healthy, they just want to be in the ground. They really do. The, the bush mallows as well. They really want to be in the ground where they can do fabulous, but not in a container. Okay. Lewis Hamilton, it's such a beautiful one, but it always lays down on me. It always lays down. It like stands up with beautiful flowers, and as soon as they look great, the whole plant lays down. <laughs> they have weak stems. Okay. Uh, there were a couple of questions about the growing medium that you're using in these pots. Do you use a commercial growing medium, and or do you use a native soil? I, I changed my growing medium recently, and I'm pretty happy. With the results and what it what it what I use is I use the um, as the base is the ultra potting mix from um, American soil products. That's the, my base. But then I add a lot depending on what I'm growing. I add pumice. I add sand. I add for some things, not sand. We don't usually add, but occasionally for a few things you do. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, we add a lot of pumice. We, but now I add. It half ultra potting and half fir bark, the tiny, really ground up fir bark. Um, I mix the two of those. And then I add a, quite a bit of pumice as well. Um, pumice is really important. A lot of people use uh, perlite. I'm allergic to perlite, so I can't use it. I get <laughs> eye infections every time I use it. So. Okay. Um, vermiculite I use for a few wet loving things mixed in with the, the, with the ground fir bark and the ultra potting mix. Ultra potting mix is really just, it's just, it's not that great, but it's based on um, on the coconut fiber. Uh, so it's okay. okay. So, so 
So I have to ask, do you sell these potting soil mixes at your nursery or are they available um, around? Well, the, the ultra potting mix is from American soil. Okay. Uh, and then, I mean, we do occasionally, if somebody brings in a pot, we'll, we'll fill it up for them, you know? Um, we do charge them because it's expensive. The soil is mm -hmm. expensive for us. Right. It's, uh, it's a big expense. Uh, yeah. But yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, can you grow the Ceanothus Eldorado? And does it have any habitat value? And is it okay in a container? Well, all Ceanothus, I think, do have habitat value for sure. Mm -hmm. They're major attractors of pollinators. So, um, but the Ceanothus don't do well in containers, in my experience. Mm. The Diamond Heights is a very slow one. It does okay for a year, but then it's got to go in the ground. I um, see. And that's another one of these that the, the way that it becomes drought tolerant is it gets its roots in very, very deep. Um, and a lot of manzanitas too, but they also have some, there's a few manzanitas that are also adapted to very cramped root spaces. So mm -hmm. they do well, but I otherwise, the, and you can't, sages don't do well in general in containers over the long term for the same reasons. They need to get those roots, those really fine roots all up, out there, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Susan asks, could you bonsai a red bud in a container? And if you did, how big would that container need to be? That would be an interesting thing. Well, <laughs> for, bons for bonsais, the bonsai is a very, very specific term. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it means a plant that um, is kept, you know, very small um, through root pruning um, mm -hmm. and through this whole you know, series of treatments and stuff that you mm -hmm. do. So I do do a few bonsais, which I'll show in a little bit. Um, but in general, um, in, in general, what we do, in, instead of bonsai, we dwarf plants. And by dwarf plant, you just keep them cramped in a pot. You still have to do a little bit of root pruning with them um, mm -hmm. for most of them. And that's one reason why manzanitas, uh, most manzanitas do not like being in pot, pots for long because they can't take the root pruning, they have a different type of root system. Mm -hmm. So you, there's no really true manzanita bonsai, but there are dwarf, you know, there are manzanitas that have been dwarfed by being in containers. Um, same with some conifers. Uh, conifers can be, pretty much all of them can be bonsai, but um, they can also be dwarfed. They're really nice as dwarfs, mm -hmm. just kept small. So, and here's another one that's a dwarf. This is a um, uh, the Chilopsis linearis. Which does very well in a container for at least five or six years. Um, eventually, I think it probably has to go in the ground too, but five or six years is a pretty long time for a plant. So, yeah. Do, um, so, here's a question about the Western azalea. Is there a special kind of soil and watering frequency for that? They do need a fair amount of water, okay? And they like the soil a little bit acidic, and then it will need to be fertilized, I would say, at half strength once per year, but that's all, okay, Don't, no more than that, um, and use, you know, and, and, and then water it really well with the fertilizer, too, so you want to give it a little bit of acid fertilizer, acidic fertilizer. Okay, um, Katie is asking, are there any species that do well as indoor house plants? I, I, I get that question just about every single day. I get <laughs> phone calls. I get so many requests for, for house plants. It's, in, it's unbelievable. This past year, how many requests mm -hmm. I get for that, but every single day, somebody asks me that. And, um, I'm afraid that I, you know, they, most plant, most natives do not do well as house plants, how mm -hmm. the environment indoors, you mm -hmm. know, the lack of sun, you know, for the most part and the dry humidity, the dryness mm -hmm. of the air is a little bit difficult for them. That said, you know, I find that uh, the, the Southern maiden hair fern does okay in the bathroom, you know, where it gets some more humidity. Mm. Uh, I still like it, how it looks better outdoors. Uh, the piggyback plant is a famous plant for growing indoors. Um, and in, once again, in the bathroom, I think it would do okay. It does want the humidity a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've never kept them for long indoors. Um, there, there's probably a few others too. If somebody else has found one though, 
that they've had good good results with, please let me know. I'd love to know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, had, I had Yerba Buena indoors for a year. That did pretty oh, okay. well. Did yeah. Pretty well, and I just love the smell of it. So. Mm -hmm. so Jay wants to know where you get all these gorgeous pots. Oh, I get them everywhere I can. I do. I get a lot at thrift stores. There used to be a great pot shop over here, um, a pot store, uh, the AW Pottery, but they closed during the pandemic. So they're not there anymore. And I used to go there and I would fill up my truck with broken pots, with pots that were <laughs> cracked and broken. And I would repair them and oh, wire okay. them up and everything and then throw in them. And I would fill up my whole truck every time I went. And they charged me like a hundred bucks or something for the whole truck. Yeah. Wow. Let's, so let's see. Uh, Karen would like to know, could you please repeat the name of the marigold that you showed that the butterflies like so much? Uh, the marigold? It says marigold. Oh, Maybe oh, it was the, the, oh, the burr marigold. Yeah, the burr marigold. That's the Biden's Lavis. Biden's is B-I-D-E-N-S. Biden's, Lavis. yeah. This is L-A-E-V-I-S. Um, that's a wonderful butterfly. Okay. But it likes to be wet. It grows in, in swampy areas over but near Mount Diablo, for one. Um, mm -hmm. It comes up very, very late. It goes, when, when it goes dormant, it goes dormant late in the summer, late in the, when winter starts. Um, but then it, it doesn't come back up again until like June or something. It's very, very late. Um, but then it comes up pretty fast and puts on a really nice show for all summer, pretty much, in a large container. So, but it okay. needs to be kept wet. So I keep a, a a deep tray underneath it with water mm. uh, in it, and I and I just water it regularly. Okay. Let's see. Uh, more questions. Matthew asked, "Have you ever tried Coreopsis gigantea?" Yes, I have. I, in fact, that was probably my very first California native um, that I ever grew. Was was that? And I grew it in a in a big um, in a great big pot. And on a on a deck where I lived way up in the hills, the Oakland Hills, um, and it it was just my favorite Dr. Seuss plant for many years. So, <laughs> right, extremely ugly at times and really beautiful at others. Okay, so uh, Susan is returning to the red bud because she liked your answer, I think. So when you're dwarfing a red bud, uh, is there anything special involved there? Well, I would probably choose one that um and i get to choose a, a, from a bunch because i have a nursery but i would choose one that doesn't have a tap root and some of them don't um a tap root the, you said a tap, a, a one single tap root right goes, uh, um one that just goes straight down like that i try to encourage that in the pots because those tend to do really well in the garden when you plant them in the garden but for a pot for a container one i would look for one that doesn't have that or I would probably cut that off and mm -hmm. encourage all the other roots, the other roots, the, the fibrous roots. Um, so yeah, but it, it would be interesting to do a red bud, to try to bonsai a red, red bud. I have never seen it, but I think the leaves really lend themselves to it. it and mm -hmm. the color of the bar, it would be, it's really interesting. I, I, I think I'm going to try it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Great. Um, you mentioned at the beginning, you um, got two handfuls of berries off of a plant. I yeah. think you said it was a service berry. Do you have the name of that? It's, it's just the service berry that we sell. It's not, it doesn't fall exactly into Alnifolia or Utah Ensis. It falls okay. somewhere in between them. I think it's a wild hybrid. Wild hybrid of a, ser a service berry. Yeah. Okay. And also when I look it up, when I look those up on uh, Calflora, I find that they're uh, that they're sometimes they're called Alnifolia and sometimes they're called Utah. Mm -hmm. So okay. they had the same issue, I think. Okay, let's see. Do you allow your ferns to go dormant in the fall or winter? Do you cut them back? Is Pete there? Uh oh. Maybe we lost Pete or we lost me. Yeah, you're, you're there, Gladys. I'm gonna try texting Pete. Okay. Uh, well, he's... He was doing so good there.
Let's see if he's online. Uh oh, I think he just disappeared. Let's see what happens. I just texted him. Okay, maybe he'll come back. Sorry, folks. Network problems. Mm -hmm. Hi, do you know if all these photos are from one backyard garden? A lot of them are from Pete's nursery, but I think they're also from some of his installations as well. His nursery really is a pretty amazing place. It's, it truly is inspirational because he he is a collector, and it there there are just innumerable pots, all kinds of designs. Um, if you have time, I do highly recommend visiting. Uh, where is it again? It's in Oakland, okay. and I he's only open a few days of the week, but it's eastbaywilds.com. And so I would always recommend calling before you go over because I know I have uh, driven over there from Menlo Park before and found it closed. So it, it's helpful sometimes if you just call before you go. <laughs> oh, Pete says his internet went out. Uh oh. Um, Let's see if um, so. So, for the person that was asking about East Bay Wilds, the website shows they are only open on Fridays from nine thirty to four. Hope oh, someone else got that in the in the chat too. Hmm. I'm sorry, we may have to wrap up early tonight if he, um, I'm waiting to hear back if he thinks his internet might come back. Oh, he's trying to call and see if he can get it back. So if folks don't mind hanging out a little bit longer. Um, Gladys, do you want to try reading some of the questions? Maybe some of the rest of us can help answer some of them. Sure. Absolutely. So we were trying to answer the question about ferns in the fall. Uh, Susan asked, do you allow your ferns to go dormant in the fall and winter? Do you cut them back? Well, I can speak to what happens to ferns in the nursery because we have them in pots in the nursery <laughs> year round. Um, there are some that have their dormant times and there's nothing you can do about that. Polypody is, is definitely a fern that no matter how much you water it, it's going to go dormant. Um, there's the majority of them, though, as long as they get water, just keep going year round. Mm -hmm. uh, we have something called Koval's lip fern, which is a really nice one that goes all year round. Um, and it doesn't need that much water. So it's um, I think it's from the Sierras and it's a, a nice one for pots, too. Mm -hmm. uh, those. Um, the maiden hair ferns that he mentioned before, those will stay green year round. I mean, they have this sort of ups and downs a little bit, but as long as they receive water, they go year round. And I noticed he actually had a picture of a five finger fern, which is closely related to the, that maiden mm -hmm. hair. And that's also a nice one that will stay green year round. Do you cut back the, you know, the fronds after they've yellowed? after the new growth comes in or? We do trim back um, because we're trying to make the plants look good for sale too, because people <laughs> don't want to see them with a lot of dead fronds. Right. I know in my garden, a lot of times I just leave the dead fronds because they get used you know, by various things. Um, but Plant in the nursery, we definitely do trim back all the dead fronds. Yeah, okay. And the ferns do often respond to that by putting out new ones, more new mm -hmm. ones. So it, 
it's good visually. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. So there's a question um, from Celia who, who says, I'm trying to grow Lilium Humboldti, Humboldtii in a large pot. Um, I think it's a lily. Uh, any special suggestions about keeping them healthy? Would they need some summer water in a pot? I think that's some kind of bulb or corm. It is. I have that in my garden. They get really tall. It's one of the tallest ones. Mm. Um, it doesn't need water in the summer. I think naturally it will go dormant in the summer. But mm. I have not tried it in a pot, but you know, we have Lilium partilam in the nursery and it's fine. And I think Humboldtia, even though it's larger, I would imagine it would also be fine in a pot, but allow it to go dormant in the summer. Okay. Yeah, I'm just looking it up on the cal, um, calscape.org, which has some really great information. It says to let it go dry in the summer. There we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> and that one, it is spectacular. I mean, it gets up to six feet tall. Yeah. So it's, uh, this says eight feet tall. Oh, all right. Even taller than that. That's crazy. Yeah. Let's see. Um, let's see. Madeline asks, what native would you suggest for a container on a deck that gets shade in the morning and sun in the middle of the day? Ooh, that's interesting. And by the way, so Pete says he's out. Oh, he not, um, it's an yeah, outage to bring them back. Okay. Uh, I mean, if you guys want to still answer, have a few questions, go through questions, we can do that for a little while. I think there's several of us who are here and anybody who wants to pipe in, if they have experience that they want to share, please mm -hmm. feel free to unmute and, and speak up. Uh, but let's see, we were talking about, let's see, pots that. Yeah. It's uh, uh, on a deck that it's shade in the morning and sun in the afternoon in the middle of the day sorry middle of the day so not well, i think madeline exposed. mentioned um, monkey flowers because monkey flowers are good they they can stay in a pot um they get scraggly after a couple years though i i don't know i wouldn't keep a monkey flower in a pot for more than two or three years but you can mm -hmm. they will take shade some shade in the, the morning and they'll definitely take sun in the afternoon um yeah. Well, in my experience, they don't like that hot sun in the afternoon. It's a pretty, I just like to have pots on my deck and it's a challenging environment. Oh, that's right. I'm in Menlo Park. You are in Saratoga. So it is a lot like hotter. I'm near 85 yeah. and it gets hot. <laughs> yeah. And I'm always struggling with pots on my deck. But mm. monkey flowers are fabulous in containers. And I give them, I think they do my, the one that does fabulously gets um, morning sun and afternoon shade. And I've had it going now for three years and it still looks fantastic. And it probably will not last forever, but they don't last forever in the ground either. Yeah. And then you can plant another small one. And um, anyway, if you want monkey flowers that look be great, I would recommend trying a pot. They okay. bloom for like 10 months. Yeah. So here's a question that is, um, does anybody remember the grass that Pete showed with the pale gold tassel head seeds? Mm. No, I'm I don't not sure. Yeah, foliosa, I think. Would you mind repeating that? I think it was Calamagrasta foliosa. Ah, that sounds right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, Curtis asks, are there any local waterways that have a variety of native aquatic plants? Wow. Uh, that is an interesting question because I think almost everything that all the waterways I've seen are filled with invasive. <laughs> I mean, it's really sad. Um, what about Pescadero Marsh? Oh, that might be. I haven't been to Pescadero Marsh, so I it, can't speak about that I, one. I think, I don't know that it has, it has a lot of native plants and it seems to not have very many invasives. Hmm. I haven't explored it that much, but that might be a good place. I wonder if that has a community of, you know, stewards that kind of keep an eye on it. 
Yeah, I mean, it's a great place to go birding too. Okay, a couple more questions. Um, Maria is sharing that, uh, you know, East Bay Wilds Nursery is only open on Fridays and that there is a Facebook page where you can follow um, Pete and get updates. That's great, so thank you, Maria. Let's see. Uh, oh, somebody wants to know what my background is. I don't know. <laughs> Everyone asks me that and I have no answer yet. So someday somebody will identify it. Um, let's see, I've heard, this is Barbara. I've heard that, oh no, a soul big. I've heard that ceramic pots for planting should not be glazed on the interior. Is that right? Oh, that's interesting. I haven't heard that before. Yeah. And now that I think about it, none of my ceramic pots are glazed on the inside. Mm -hmm. So I have no experience with that. Let's see what this. I have oh, both. Pete says he's back up again. Maybe he'll be able yeah. to get back on. Ooh. That would be a great question for Pete. It would be a great question for Pete. <laughs> with the variety of pots that he seems to have collected, he must have an answer to that. So here at Radhika sharing that Portola State Park Streamside has native aquatic plants. Good to know. Hmm. Yeah. And Madeline, your, your comment about bulbs and pots not being eaten by gophers. I've also found that if I put rocks on the top of the pots, as we saw in a lot of Pete's photos, it keeps the squirrels from digging and hiding their things in there. Yes, I have to do the same thing. Yeah. I now have, I now every, every rock I dig up, I save for the, yep. um, oh, Pete's back. Yep. All right. Yeah, people feed squirrels uh, peanuts in our neighborhood and they all end up in my pots. So I had to go around looking for rocks. Yay, Pete, you're back. Welcome. Oh, yeah. yay. <laughs> Woohoo. Um, it says that the host disabled my, my screen sharing. Okay, let me turn that back on. Um, where did it go? There you are. All right, you should be able to share again. Okay. Yeah, you Great. should probably go ahead and let Pete complete his slides, I think. I'm sorry about that, everybody. The internet went out for a few minutes and then it came back on. I'm gonna have to call them later about that. What a bummer. So anyway, so um, I was answering questions if you want to continue with the questions. I'm just flipping through. These are different um, things that I work with. This is a Port Orford cedar, and this is a Monterey cypress. Um, here's another water pot here. Um, this is a, a Port Orford cedar that, these are pretty enormous um, spheres right now, but this is a Port Orford cedar that has been trained to be a, a round ball like this. And I just prune it like this regularly. But I, this is a ponderosa pine that I plan on um, bonsaiing. Um, here's a Dudleya uh, cespitosa in a foot. The, and then buckwheats and different things. Anyway, this is a really lovely little pot here. This has a uh, manzanita, a, a, one of the Edmundsiais with a, a Marion Sampson um, hummingbird mint. And then the, one of my favorite plants to grow in containers is this a fern in the back here, which is a local endangered, endangered species, um, Colville's lip fern, uh, Myriopterus, it's called, Myriopterus covillii. Um, but this one um, tends to, it spores out really well, and the spores come up in the bottom of other pots. It comes out of the hole of other pots if I have it raised up, like in a pot stand or something. They always reproduce that way. Uh, there's, Anyway, I use all different kinds of things for containers, um, but it's all about whether it has the right drainage, you know, the right drainage holes, 
um, and you can make those or adjust those um, if you have a ceramic drill bit um, for ceramic things or just something to punch big holes in like this, this industrial container here, which I like using industrial containers a lot. So here's some more of them. We can use all kinds of things. So um, for containers, and these are many different ones. Oh, these are really old photos, some of these. Wow, I didn't realize these were in there. Then we build containers all the time too, like this one here. Um, raised container, raised beds we do a lot. Um, so to change the, the, the height of the garden a little bit, it's, a, it's really nice to do for some plants in particular. Um, this is outside my old house. This is a garden we did. We do containers in the garden also, where we have a bunch in this garden here too. This house just sold. <laughs> so, oh, here's a, uh, this is the agave. I think it's either perii or utahensis. It's a native agave in a large pot. We, we have a ton of these for sale also at the nursery. These, the native agaves, two of them, two different kinds. Perii and utahensis, I think. Anyway, these are just experiments over the years. Um, so, and some, a lot of these I still have going. Um, this is the fern. Somebody was asking me about ferns, whether when they go dormant, what do I do? Do I cut them down? And yes, I do. I cut them off. Um, and it, when they go dormant, like the lady fern goes completely dormant in the wintertime. And then it, it comes back pretty quick though, afterwards. Bracken fern, bracken, I love bracken fern. It, it is beautiful in a large container, um, but it does go dormant in the wintertime. So, but that's how I propagate it. I propagate them in large pots. Um, and they tend to really spread well in the pot. They're a little bit difficult in the ground unless you happen to have a bed that's completely separate from the rest of your garden, um, like a sidewalk strip. Um, and we do grow them in sidewalk strips in several places and they do well there. So here's, this is the, this, it's a really lovely glaucous blue colored strawberry. And this is the Sierra strawberry, Fragaria virginiana. It has a nice blue color to it. It's different pots. This is a Luisia. I should talk about Luisias too, because that's an important one. Hoikeras. Um, oh, recently I found a Hoikera that does really great in pots in full sun. And that's the Hoikera Mariamia. Uh, Mariam's, um, Mariam's coral bells or something like that. But it grows in cliff faces in little pockets in the rocks and it can completely dry out and still live through it and flower beautifully. So that's a new one for me. Elegance has done well. The Hoikera Elegance has done well for me in containers as well. So um, I'll talk about um, monkey flowers, eh, so-so. They can be beautiful in containers, but um, I'll talk about Luisias now a little bit. Luisias, the, there's a, cause there's a trick. We had um, this one pot of Luisia that flowered nonstop for six years without stopping and then it stopped and now it has long breaks again so but the the way that we got it to go so well we propagated many many hundreds if not thousands of 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 um of Luisius from this one and the way that we, we we grow it is it likes to be it likes to have pot feet so the the hole in the bottom of the pot is up off the ground it needs to have air circulation around that hole okay so I like to use not too deep of a pot, you know, three, four inches is fine um, for Luisias, but then it, um, it, but then it needs to have large holes that are, you can protect them with a little piece of the hardware cloth to hold the soil in, um, but that gives it enough of the air circulation around it to, for it to really thrive. And then you need to fertilize it with any commercial fertilizer every other month at half strength. And that keeps it flowering for a very long time. It, I mean, it was massive at times and it, it's in a small pot. So uh, this is another nice one that I like to use. This is the, um, the what's it called? The um, little, uh, what's this called? The little uh, Dicentra, Dicentra Formosa. I forget the common name. This is actually the pot that became my Luisia pot that flowered for six years. 
and here's a coastal wood fern that has grown and grown and grown in a large pot. I had this for seven years in a, in a pot and just grew and grew and grew. And then I divided it into, in, into about 60 of them and sold them separately. So I do like ferns and pots. These are sword ferns in a large pot. Um, and then a bunch of things. Anyway, Dudleyus. Um, Dudleyus also like really good circulation. And as I mentioned, as soon as the flower stops to go by, then you need to stop watering them all together. This is, was my first Dudleya that I ever grew. Believe it or not, I found it as a little teeny plant in the dump when we were, when we were at the dump one day. I found a Dudleya that somebody had thrown out there and I put it in the pot and this is what I got. So this was a long time ago. Another Dudleya that's really nice to use, this is Cespitosa, but the one that I really like to use is, um, well, besides Noma is the, um, the form of the, what is it? The Dudleya Formosa, the, the common one, the, the beach one, the coast Dudleya. Farinosa? Farinosa, thank you. <laughs> and this is Simosa here, uh, the Canyon Dudleya, which does so-so for me. It's a little difficult. Cespitosa, Cespitosa. Um, this is Hassii. This is Dudleya Virens, Hassii, the Catalina Dudleya. This one does very, very well in containers too. Um, and looks really nice. The, but the Farinosa, which really gets a cool look, I'll, I'll get to one soon. This is, Simosa gets some really nice color in it, nice orange color. This is a, the Farinosa. Um, I just love the flower stalks on these. Um, and they get really full. Here it is mixed, a mixed um, flower box I did with Echeverias and Dudleyas. There's a fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. And then here we have uh, some, probably, I don't know which kind. And then this is a, a rare native called um, Sedum divergence. It's the uh, Siskiyou stonecrop. And that turns brilliant red colors. Um, so it's a really nice one too. There's a, uh, oh, this is a Santa Barbara, I think. Munchkin. Anyway, you can see the different containers I use. And I use a lot of rocks, of course. This is the Noma, and this is Sedum Divergence. This is Sedum Spatulifolium, the, the coast stone crop. So, and of course, Pulvora Lenta and Bertonii, we grow those. Somewhere, this is a Virens Hassii, this Catalina Lifero. This one, it gets these really nice colors when it flowers. A lot of Dudleyas, Really, when they're starting to flower, suddenly you see this whole rainbow of colors come in, which is nice. Another one. A few more. So here it is. There's one that's been there for a few years. Here's some uh, Bretoni eyes. And this is Hassii again. See those nice colors it gets. So, and then. Here's another plant that another native that is a great one for shade pot. This is and because this one hangs down really beautifully. You can grow it in a large pot. This is Tiarella, the foam, the what is it called the foam flower or something like that? But it Tiarella is a really nice native plant for pots because it hangs really nicely. Here's a, a um, pulverolenta. It's three feet across. It's huge. Here it is again. And here's one that um, I have an Antonii right now that has, this is one that has a, um, what's it called when the, um, it splits and you get a double like that. Um, anyway, it's a, it's a weird thing that happens to some plants and it's happened to several Dudleyas for me. So here, this is um, also the, the Ternosa. And this is the, oh, I'm not sure which one this is. This one might be that. The, a diff, this is that, um, what's his name? It's a guy's name, writer, Andreas Writer or something like that. This is named after him. It's a nursery hybrid. Here's Farinosa that is nice and full, but see how beautiful it gets over time? It has the coolest flowers. And that's a particular Farinosa that we've been growing and we, for quite a few years now. And this one is a really nice one. We don't have a name. This is Cespitosa. This is that Farinosa again. 
different ones. Um, here's another plant that's really nice. This is the Serpentine Night Giant Stream Orchid. This is the one that um, Roger Rach found up on the cedars uh, with a nice purple color. It's only nice for a short period of time, but horsetails also do well in containers if the containers are large enough. And you don't want them in the garden generally because they tend to spread like crazy. So it's nice to have a way to contain them. This one has done very well for me in containers. This is the um, Arugaron Glauca um, Martha Roderick, Martha Roderick, yeah, that's what it is. Um, with the very fine petals like that. But this one does really well year after year in containers. A lot of those, the beach daisies, the, the, the um, Arugaron Glaucas, they tend to do great for a year, then they wear out all the nutrients that they need and never flower again. But this is one that in containers, as long as I fertilize it, does flowers year after year, the Martha Roderick one. Um, and this is a, the, um, another one called, uh, I the name of it. <laughs> Here's another one that does well in a large enough container. This is the Conejo buckwheat, um, Ariaganum crocatum, which I just love these. These do great in the garden too, and they can be very, very long lived. Um, I take care of one that's um, 30 years old. So they can live for a very long time. And they're beautiful. And they tend to spread. They come up wherever they want to. They come up in other pots and stuff. So um, here's one I took a picture of. Um, this is a cross that we got at the nursery between the polifolium, the cliff buckwheat, and um, Ariaganum grande rubescens. And this will eventually form a very full uh, plant that loaded with these flowers. And they, and they hang down over. So this is one that it sprawls really nicely and with really nice colors. This is the same one. So it lives a long time. Here's another unusual buckwheat. The, that's one of the um, Nivaeum, I think it's called. Nivaeum. Here's one I just saw the other day in West Oakland. This is latifolium, the straight Ariaganum latifolium. And here's a grande rubescence here with a lot of this particular latifolium has really beautiful, great big heads on them, really nice flower heads. So I really like this one. And I, I use latifolium in gardens all the time, and it, not, it, it just takes to the garden setting so nicely, and they pop up wherever they want to pop up, and I'm happy with them. Here's a Shasta sulfur. This is a um, Donner Pass buckwheat. This one is difficult. And it's very difficult in containers, in the ground, wherever. But I love the leaf color that it gets when the winter starts. So that one, yeah, this one is such a pretty color, but I've had a hard time growing it. And then erythroniums can be grown in, in containers. You have to have, I like to have a lot of containers that can be, you know, so that I, with things that are seasonal. And this is one of those things that are seasonal. This is has to go completely dormant in the summertime. A lot of the lilies can be do really well in a right size container, but they do need to go completely dormant, no water whatsoever in the summer. So strawberries are easy. Here's a little hollowed out brick with a goldback fern, a coast strawberry, and a little sedum, spathulifolium. Here's the Sierra Buck. Uh, this is the Sierra strawberry again. So, and here's, um, this is a, a, what do they call them? God, my names are, Fritillaria, thank you. It's a biflora, I think, stink bells or one of those. But um, those really, I mean, those are almost impossible to grow in the ground in the nursery, uh, or excuse me, in a garden, but you can grow them in containers, so but they are completely dormant for more than half the year. So. Here's uh, one of the cypresses. This is a Takati cypress. That one does really well for a long time. I'd like to, I'm gonna, one of these days, um, bonsai one. This is that, this is a, the Orium, that's the Monterey cypress um, selection or hybrid or selection, excuse me, another one. And here's a Monterey cypress that's been bonsai just beautifully. And this has done really well for me in containers. This is Yucca whiplei or the um, 
their Hespera yucca is the new name for it. This is a seven foot tall flower spike and it's growing in a container and with these beautiful flowers. And I've had it, I had had it for years and I, I didn't think it would ever flower. Then suddenly it started to flower and then it flowered seven feet tall in a container. But you have to place them very, very carefully because they are deadly, deadly spikes on these things. You do not want to run into them. Pete, I wanted to give you a five minute warning. Okay. Are there more questions that people have? There are Um, questions. Okay, let's jump in. So there's a collection of questions around feeding. How do you approach feeding for all these different kinds of plant plants and different kinds of pots? And are there is there a brand that you um, recommend? Well, I wouldn't say a brand, but I get organic fish fertilizer, and um, and I use it at half strength or quarter strength um, sometime, and I use it for just about everything a little bit. But there are a few things that can't take it um, at, at all, and you have to be careful that when you fertilize them. I'm starting to learn about the whole nursery regimen of fertilizers where you use the root fertilizers then the foliage fertilizers and the flower fertilizers, but I'm still learning all that. Um, but it's having really good results so far. So to get things to really flower nicely and fill up the pots nicely. So, but it's a learning curve for yeah. me. Okay. Uh, some questions about fuchsias, California fuchsias. Would they work as a container plant? Um, I, that's another one that I don't think would. I, I, I've had them for a little while, but they don't last very long. Um, they last much longer when they're in the ground. But um, nice idea. Mm-hmm. Um, Robin says she has California fuchsia growing in shallow redwood barrels, but I think later she changed it to oak barrels, um, and they do well. And she says she waters them more and they're starting to bloom now. So, yeah, I've just found that the flowers don't last that long when they're in, mm. in, okay. in, the, in the nursery or in pots, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. Someone, oh, is the fish fertilizer a liquid form? Yes, yes, it is. Okay. It is. And I spray fertilize everything. So you spray on the, yeah. is it foliage or? It's a, it's a foliar. Yeah. Foliar. Okay. But it, it also goes into the soil. So. Okay. So we have a, 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 I guess it's a tough situation where there's a deck and it gets shade in the morning, but it gets that midday sun. What kind of a container plant would, would grow there? Well, I find that the Louisias and the Dudleyas really do fantastic in with all day sun, they can take all day sun uh, or half day sun, whatever really. Um, not all the deadliest, but like the Pulverolenta and Britonii, those ones really um, are for mostly shade. Um, but the Farinosa and the Noma, uh, and, and some of them do great in the full sun. Okay. Or in the hot afternoon sun. And yeah. then other things, other things, uh, some of the Manzanitas do well, but the manzanitas, you can grow them in full sun in containers, but the containers should be large enough, um, which should be fairly large, like really a two foot tall container by two foot wide is mm. ideal for a manzanita in a container. Mm. Um, and then you have to water them like clockwork um, when they're in containers. Mm-hmm. So is sun from 10 to four sufficient for a native agave? Oh yeah, easy. 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 Yeah. Okay. It could take up to half shade. Mm. Fine. Okay. So some of them look better with that, actually, with some shade. Let's see. My another one. Uh, do the Echeveria and Dudleyas like a standard succulent fertilizer occasionally? Yes, I would say I would say not occasionally, but regularly. Um, just half strength and no more than every two months. Okay. Yeah. I hear a lot of recommendations about half strength and quarter strength. Is there ever a time that we're using fertilizer as is recommended on the bottle? Um, yeah. For um, the Arugaram Glaucus, the beach daisies, they like that, but not mm. many things do. But, I, mm. but some things do. There's a few things. Mm. 
Is that there's they just tend to make them too strong? Well, they, it's about timing. Yeah, it's about timing. Well, the plants that are you know that that they sell at Home Depot stuff the non-native stuff, it, it's been they've been bred to mm. take this regimen. You know, this really, mm -hmm. and they they grow exactly the way they're supposed to grow. Whereas natives, they're you know they're often growing poor soils, mm -hmm. um, but they do receive something. Um, they receive the, you know, even when they're growing on cliff faces, they're receiving minerals and things, mm -hmm. that they need, um, as well as bird droppings and stuff. So really they can take some fertilizer, most things, but it's also about timing because as soon as the flower starts to go by, they don't want any fertilizer and some things don't want any water after that. So mm -hmm. you know, keep that in mind. Yeah. So a couple people want to know which buckwheats you would recommend. You mentioned several. Do you have yeah. some favorites? My favorite is that cross, that polyfolium cross with ground iridescence. That one just looks fantastic in containers for a really long time, too. Um, they tend to just do really well. And I, I do deadhead them, um, which keeps them flowering, too. Um, and it works mm -hmm. for, the, for some of them. Um, but that's the one I like the most. But even ground iridescence. There's one that's occasionally available, Rosy Cushion, that's done also really well for me in containers. So, uh, but other ones, the Procatum, has done very well for me in containers. I had one for 10, 11 years um, before it finally died, but that one was like a little bonsai, a really cool one. Okay. Um, a question about the plants that are in the water bowls. Yes. A lot of rocks so they can get in there do those like this what you're showing right here is there soil in there or these are strictly water i put in a little bit of clay soil from the ground in mm -hmm. containers by the way containers should never have the you know soil from the ground clay mm -hmm. in them except for water plants mm -hmm. um, everything else just needs solid organic matter the coir the the the, the peat or or, or um, pumice or perlite, whatever, they shouldn't have any soil in them. Okay. In a pot, except for water plants. And okay. So it's a little that on the bottom and then the other material, the structural material as well. Then ruts, then ruts and generally they just fill up with roots really quickly. I mean, I might have an inch of soil in this one here and the, then it just fills up with roots. So once a year I have to empty the whole thing and tear it all apart and just put a little teeny piece back in because it mm. fills up so much, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The birds love this here. We're past nine, so how about if we take maybe one or two more questions and then wrap it up? Okay, that. okay. I have two more questions. <laughs> oh, perfect. Um, one is about the rocks. You have rocks and many, many of your plants uh, in the containers on top. They're beautiful. In fact, the whole presentation you've shared tonight has been very, very inspiring and, and, and beautiful. Do the rocks serve other purposes other than aesthetics? Yes, a big, a, yeah, very, very much so, especially with here, the Louisias, for example. Um, Louisias tend to rot really quickly if their leaves touch wet soil. Mm. Okay, so I make sure that any pot with Louisia and Dudleya particularly have rocks all, all around them and underneath the leaves so that their leaves never touch the soil. Um, and that it helps a lot. It, it also helps to insulate the soil. I use big rocks sometimes um, and that helps keep the soil temperature at it. At a, it it, it ke keeps it from getting too hot or mm. too cold. So I it, see. It holds it, holds the warmth at night, which the manzanitas really like that. If the, if the rocks hold the heat, the manzanitas also respond really well to a rock mulch. Okay, last question. It's a two-parter. Uh, do the ceramic pots that you use, do you recommend the interior be unglazed or glazed? Does it matter? I don't and think it matters. You don't think it matters. And then how about irrigation in a containers using <clears throat> some kind of irrigation system? Yeah, we, we make them all the time. We make irrigation systems for pots um, all the time. And you can do it with the cheapo um timer for a, a cheapo clock irrigation clock from home depot just put on the hose thing and run it to your pots it's, it's easy to do just don't overwater things you know like louisias they they what louisias want is they want the soil to be 
they want to get water like twice a week, but it needs to drain completely out and dry up within a couple hours of watering. That's why you need the big hole and that the pot feet to keep it up off the ground a little bit so that it can dry out quickly because that's what they really respond to. Regular water, but really fast drainage. So many things really respond well to that. Okay. This is the Noisia, by the way, that flowered for six years nonstop. That's beautiful. Uh, yeah, I mean, it just never stopped. <laughs> yeah. And that's probably an unglazed pot, right? Um, the inside is unglazed. The inside is unglazed. That's the answer of the night. No, I, and, I don't think that matters, really, honestly. Okay. And I think that we're out of time now. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Pete. That was wonderful. And it's so funny that when we see a pot, I, in your intro, the slide intro that I did for your talk, I just used a couple of pictures that I had taken in your nursery. And one of the pictures is of that Louisia pot. <laughs> it is spectacular. Yeah. yeah. I did want to mention that um, the nursery is open to the public every Friday from 9.30 to 4. And it's, sometimes it's open on Saturday, but really that Friday is the day to come. And I'm landscaping on the other days. That's why it's not open other days. But please try to come on Fridays. So it's a lot of fun. Okay, folks. Well, Pete, that was amazing. I'm so thankful that you were able to be here and I'm, I'm really glad you were able to get back on after that internet flip. And thank you all for hanging in there through the little technical difficulties. Um, and Pete, I hope to have you back again. I may be talking more about buckwheats and uh, that thing about invasives and getting into the wildland. We would love to hear about that. It's an important topic. So thank you, everybody. Um, next week, we have a talk on butterfly gardening and uh, caterpillar host plants. So hope to see you next week or the week after. And uh, I'm going to be ending the session now. So good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Pete.